Let's give our attention now to the reading of God's Word. I am starting a series of messages today entitled Christ in the Old Testament. Let us hear God's Word from Genesis chapter 3. If you listen carefully, you will hear the memory verse from December. Let us hear the Word of God. This is after the fall of Adam and Eve, when Eve disobeyed God and ate from the fruit of the tree, that she was forbidden to eat. And when Adam saw and Eve saw that the food was good and delightful to the eye, they ate, and she gave to Adam, and he ate. And then we find that it wasn't Adam and Eve that went looking for God. <coughs> this is very important. It wasn't Adam and Eve that initiated a restored relationship with God, but it was God who came to seek out Adam and Eve. And in that beautiful poetry in the book of Genesis, that Adam and Eve heard the steps of the Lord walking in the garden in the cool of the day. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it, or you will die. You will not certainly die. The serpent said to the woman, For God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. And when the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye, and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and she ate it. She also gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they realized they were naked. And so they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. And then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And they hid from the Lord. God, excuse me, they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord called to the man, Where are you? He answered, I heard you in the garden, and I, I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. And he said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? The man said, The woman you put here with me, she gave me some fruit from the tree, and I ate it. And then the Lord God said to the woman, What is this you have done? The woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate it. And so the Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you among all livestock and all wild animals. You will crawl on your belly and you will eat dust all the days of your life. Now here's the verse. And I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. And to the woman he said, I will make your pains in childbearing very severe. With painful labor, you will give birth to children. Your desire will be for your husband, and he will rule over you. And to Adam he said, Because you listened to your wife and ate fruit from the tree about which I commanded you, you must not eat from it. Cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil, you will eat food from it all the days of your life. It will produce thorns and thistles for you, and you will eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your brow, 
you will eat your fruit until you return to the ground, since from it you were taken. For dust you are, and to dust you will return. Adam named his wife Eve because she would become the mother of all of the living. May God, the Holy Spirit, who inspired these words, who has preserved these words for our hearing, may God be praised and blessed. And may we learn and grow as we are in his house today. Please pray with me. Lord, I pray now that the words of my mouth and the decisions and the responses and reactions of our hearts and minds would always be acceptable and pleasing to you. Because you alone, O God, are our rock. And are we here? Amen. God's plan of salvation, Christ in the Old Testament. And as I was preparing this series of lessons, from time to time, if we're all honest with ourselves, from time to time, we have doubts. I have doubts. Satan will try anything to get us off track. So I have an amazing illustration this morning. You may not remember anything else I say today, but I think you will remember this amazing illustration in a moment. A gentleman by the name of Peter Stoner, who has passed, was the chairman of mathematics and astronomy at Pasadena College. Many of you are familiar with the Christian group InterVarsity, it is a Christian organization of college students. And years ago, Peter Stoner worked with about 600 students from InterVarsity Christian Fellowship. And they looked at eight specific prophecies about Jesus in the Old Testament. Of course, there are many, many more. But they looked at eight, and I'm going to share those with you in a moment. And... Um, I wasn't real good in math. I got as far as like algebra 2 and I struggled. I didn't get into statistics and calculus and all that fun stuff. But they looked at the probability, right, in the area of mathematics of all eight passages being fulfilled in Christ. And the probability of all eight of these specific prophecies being filled is 10 to the 17th power. We're going to talk about that number, because those look like little numbers, but let me assure you, they are very big. So let me just share with you, and there are many more than these eight, but here are eight main prophecies that Jesus fulfilled. The Messiah would be born in Bethlehem, Micah 5, 2. A messenger will prepare the way for the Messiah, Malachi 3, 1. The Messiah will enter Jerusalem as a king on a donkey. Zechariah 9, 9. The Messiah will be betrayed by a friend and suffer wounds in his hands. Zechariah 13, verse 6. The Messiah will be betrayed for 30 pieces of silver. Zechariah 11, 12. The betrayer's money would be used to purchase a potter's field. Also, in Zechariah 11, verse 12, uh, 13. The Messiah will remain silent while he is afflicted. Isaiah 53. That whole chapter, Isaiah 53, speaks of Jesus, the silent, suffering servant of God. Right? Is that passage? He opened not his mouth. The eighth prophecy, the Messiah will die by having his hands and feet pierced. Psalm 22, 16. And again, if you look at Psalm 22, that whole psalm uh, speaks very clearly to the Messiah that would come. So 10 to the power of 17. I'm going to illustrate how astronomically hot that number is. If I had an offering plate or a hat, and I put in 10 tickets, and I uh, walked over to Alan, and I said, Alan, here, I have a special mark on one of these 10 tickets. 
the probability that he would pick the one with the mark on it would be what? One in ten. Not very good odds. What about ten to the seventeenth power? Ten to the power of seventeen in silver dollars is sufficient to cover the state of Texas two feet deep. Now, if we had that many silver dollars, and I put a mark on one of those silver dollars and dropped it somewhere in Texas and tell someone who's blindfolded they can go anywhere in the state and pick up the one marked silver dollar, what would be the odds that he would choose the mark? 10 to the 17th power. That is how unbelievable it would be to say that just these eight passages in reference to Christ all were fulfilled. And you know there was a false doctrine in the early church. There were those that believed that Jesus knew about the Messiah and so he purposely lived his life to fulfill all of the prophecies. However, there's a little bit of a problem. Did you control where he would be born? Jesus didn't have anything to do with how, where he would be born. How he would die. All of these passages. So these, just these eight prophecies, to be coincidental, to apply to any person, by chance, is 10 to the 17th power. The same odds as if we cover the state of Texas in two feet of silver dollars. And I said to you, I want you to pick out the one that's marked. Isn't that amazing? Uh, I hope as you're hearing that for the first time, as I've talked about it and thought about it this week, that that really sinks in how incredible it is that all these prophecies, and we're going to be looking at them in the weeks to come, same odds of Jesus fulfilling all the prophecies. God told the serpent, because you've done this, you're cursed, cursed to be on all cattle and on animals, cursed to sleep on your belly and eat dirt all your life. I'm declaring war between you and the woman, between your offspring and hers. He'll wound your head, and you'll wound his heel. Let's take a look at that. By the way, this is known in theology as the Proto-Evangelium. You want to sound smart? Tell your friends and family in church today, Pastor, to talk about the Proto-Evangelium. That word proto means what? First. Like a prototype. Evangelium means good news. The first case of good news in the Bible is in this passage. You say, Pastor, I don't see it. Well, we're going to look at it today. We're going to find it. We're going to see it. So I've kind of fixed up the pronouns to help us get started here. Genesis 3.15, And I, God, will put enmity, or hostility, <clears throat> between you, the serpent, and you, Eve, and between Satan's offspring and hers, Eve. Christ will crush your head, Satan. And Satan, you will strike Christ's heel. A little bit of light coming in, a little bit of understanding of what this passage means. It is so, so important. In Isaiah 53, but he, referring to Christ, was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes, we are healed. A prophecy that explains the process of salvation. That Jesus Christ, who died on a cross, took upon himself your sins. Before you were even born. All of your sins. The sins you committed the ones that you omitted, the things we omit to do, the sins that were intentional, and the sins that were unintentional. Christ 
will crush the head of the serpent. That is the prophecy in Genesis 3, 15. Now I know this is a farming area and many of you are farmers and you know farmers and you live out in the country. And so if a city person came in and said to you, there's a snake in my garage and I have this shovel. You want me to cut off its tail, right? And you say, no, 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 don't do that. If you want to kill the snake, you cut off the head. And so in this prophecy, thousands of years before Christ came, died on that cross. The foot of the cross, Satan's head was cut off, was destroyed. Because of Christ's death and resurrection, the powers of death and hell and evil <coughs> were destroyed. And they will be completely destroyed when Jesus returns. And so the symbolism is not just symbolism, but in reality, on the, at the foot of the cross, no pun intended, at the foot of the cross, Christ crushed the head, excuse me, the head of, of the serpent. That's what happened in that moment. When Jesus cried out, it is finished. Father, into thy hands I commit my spirit. You, Satan, will bruise his heel. Did Christ suffer? You better believe it. I know several people that, some in my family, that have not yet ever watched the passion of the Christ because of its brutality. Let me, as difficult as it may be, let me encourage you during this Lent season to watch that movie because it is one of the most accurate portrayals of what actually happened to Jesus Christ. The physical brutality. But then there's the emotional brutality as well as Jesus was separated from God the Father. And you and I know and the people in Ukraine know today that pain of being separated from a loved one. God and Jesus had been together from the beginning for all eternity. And during that moment when Jesus died on the cross, the, the skies became black. And we don't know exactly why that happened, but I have a theory. My theory is that it was such an atrocious event such a brutal, evil event that if God could, he would be blinded from what he was watching as darkness covered between the heavens and the earth. And so, the heel of Christ was bruised. He was bruised for our iniquity. He took upon himself that punishment that you and I deserve. So God's plan of redemption with Adam and Eve, it's the same today. The illustration may be a little bit different, but the plan is still the same. It always begins with, yes, Lord, I was wrong. I ate the forbidden fruit. Because you see, there are lots of people out there who don't believe that they need a Savior. Or they believe that they've committed wrong, but they believe if they just do enough good, do enough good, then bad. Somehow God's going to accept them into his kingdom. One of the biggest lies Satan sells people to that. Yes, Lord, I was wrong. I ate the forbidden fruit. Secondly, only then can God's redemptive love begin. And it begins that instance when you and I say, God, I messed up. Forgive me. At that moment, we're going to see something very interesting here between Eve and the serpent. So God then becomes our defender. God's word says that when we're born, we're born enemies of God. Separated from God. At war with God. Spiritual. That rebellion. And you know that rebellious spirit in Adam and Eve? That rebellious spirit is present 
in our homes across our nation. That rebellious spirit is evident in the world in which we live and we see played out every moment on television. Unfortunately, even in some churches, the spirit of rebellion takes place. But the moment we confess that God becomes our defender, praise God. Now I want you to watch this. You probably never thought about this. But can you imagine if you were Adam and Eve being sold alive? I say to Colleen, Colleen, I've got this car for you. It's only been driven on Sundays. Of course, that's not good for a pastor. <coughs> but I've got this car for you, and it's in great shape. And I sell it to you, and you find out it's a piece of junk. To be sold a lie makes you angry. I'm sure that once they were punished, when all the dust had settled, that Adam and Eve detested Satan. They probably had some self-hatred too and guilt for because they were let into it. But Eve detested the serpent and Adam, I'm sure, for the deceit and the lie. But the feeling was mutual. Satan detested Adam and Eve because instead of being aligned with Satan, now Adam and Eve, through the forgiveness of Christ, and God becomes their defender, that they become the recipients of God's love and grace and forgiveness. Satan detested Adam and Eve because Satan fell from God's glory. There was no hope for Satan. And don't you think Satan said, I've done everything I could to mess up the relationship between God and Adam and Eve. And look what God does. He's providing a Savior. Couldn't even let me gloat in my evil for another couple chapters. Because this message to Adam and Eve is a message of hope, a message of forgiveness. So as we close, <coughs> found some interesting things in studying this passage. Because we ask ourselves, how much of this plan did Eve understand. I mean, we read it, and we hear it, you know, and we, we need some help and explanation of that verse. Well, what, what about Adam and Eve? How much did they understand? I think possibly more than you and I might think. I want to share with you finally a verse from Genesis chapter 4. Which in many translations, if you go home and look in your Bible, you will see a phrase in the translation of that verse, which is not technically from the Hebrew. All that Eve knew was that the Messiah was going to be born through the seed of the woman. We often think of the seed of the man when we talk about reproduction. But it is through the seed of the woman that the Messiah would come. Verse 4. Now the man had relations with his wife Eve, and she conceived and gave birth to Cain. And she said, I have gotten a man-child. See that parenthesis with the help of the Lord? That's not in there originally. Look at the bottom, Genesis 4, 1, it says, or man, or what? After the man, the Lord. There are those scholars, and I'm just throwing this out here in relation to did Eve understand more than what we think she knew. But there are scholars who believe that when Eve became pregnant and gave birth, that that verse can be translated, I have gotten the Lord. I have gotten the Lord. You see, it would be the same if I said to Jerry, Jerry, I'm going to give you, you and your family a million dollars. And a week goes by, a month goes by, a year goes by. You say, what about that million dollars, Pastor Rob? <laughs> say, well, Jerry, 
I've arranged that in a thousand years from now. <laughs> Adam and Eve, I think, realized that the birth of the Messiah was going to come thousands of years later. But I want to point out that in Genesis chapter 4, I have gotten the Lord. And why wouldn't she think that since God had just told her that from her seed, right? Seed of the woman, not the man. Galatians 4, but when the set time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law. Not the seed of the man, but of the woman. And so we read that when Mary became pregnant, she couldn't understand because she said, I've not had relations with anyone. How, how is this to be? And you remember during Advent, we read, as the power of the Holy Spirit shall come upon you, and that which is born of you will be of God. It's why the virgin birth is so important. It fulfills prophecy. In Isaiah, not even in the mix of the eight passages that I shared with you. Not only can't you control where you're born, but you can't control who your parents are. In the book of Isaiah, I think it's Isaiah, Behold, a woman shall conceive, a virgin shall conceive, and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. There was no doubt that Jesus, who was born, who came into the earth, came from God. Now, God could have done it any number of different ways. And there are still people who disbelieve in the virgin birth. You know, there's an old expression, ignorance you can fix, but you can't fix stupid. <laughs> you know, God lays it all out there. And if, and if we don't accept it, we don't believe it, that's our problem. That's God's. And so the redemption, the forgiveness, the new life now and forever that we receive in Christ goes back to Genesis 3.15. But the warfare between Satan and the world which continues today, between his seed, Satan's seed, and the woman's seed. But guess what? Although Satan was able to bruise the head of Christ on the cross, Christ was able to crush his head. It is because of the empty tomb, the resurrection of Jesus Christ, that we will be celebrating in a few weeks, that we have this joy and this hope and this promise. It is in this we believe that Christ is coming again. This time he's coming, not as a baby born in a manger, but he will be coming as King of Kings and Lord of Lords to bring to an end human history, as we know. And if you haven't heard already, I'm sure there will be gospel preachers and radio preachers that will be taking the events in Russia and Ukraine and twisting and converting that to make it the end times. And the only thing I say about that is God's word is we don't know when the end time is going to be, but we are to be ready for it. So anyone that says to you, this is Russia in the Bible, and this is the United States, and this is the Middle East, and this is Ukraine, don't believe that. Because God's word says not even the angels in heaven know. As a matter of fact, the Bible says not even the sun knows until that day when he is sent. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your words today in this passage that is somewhat like a puzzle, but Lord, we thank you that your spirit has helped me and has helped us to put these pieces together that we would understand your marvelous plan of salvation. Be with us in the weeks ahead as we look at all the prophecies concerning your uh, birth and your life and death and resurrection. Lord, that this would strengthen our faith, that this would remove our doubts, that we would say this is only true and only so, because God so planned it in Jesus' name.